Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Clément Léger from Rivos. Uh, I used to work on more exotic architecture, so I'm quite new to the Risk of Five uh, architecture. So please bear with me if I say silly things. Silly things. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Supervisor Software Events extension, uh, which is the SBI extension. Um, so why do we want to do that? So the SSE extension is uh, much like Harm SDI, and it will allow us to inject mod to um, HS mod from higher privilege mod. And we need to inject high priority events, which can not be masked at all, and that can interrupt the kernel at any time. Uh, this can be used for um, reliability, availability, and serviceability errors, so RAS errors. And this one, these one are errors that need to be handled as fast as possible. Um, we'll also be using that for the PMU overflow IRQs. So and also for power virtualized asynchronous page fault. So the SBI specification was sent by uh, Himanshu and Hanup, and it's actually uh, currently being discussed on the Tech PRS workgroup. Um, so how do we plan to do that? So the S mod will actually register some event handlers, which will be called upon specific events by the SBI. Um, and we have different types of events, uh, local, global, um, events, IDs. And upon these specific events, the SBI will actually uh, divert the execution to replace the interrupted context with uh, the SSC handler entry context and resume the execution at the specified uh, handler entry. And upon SSC handler uh, completion, the handler needs to call uh, SBI call to complete and resume the execution. From a supervisor mod uh, OS point of view, uh, it's almost orthogonal to OS normal operation, um, which means that there is no impact at all on the normal um, execution of the system. And it does not use the regular interrupt path. Yeah, it will use some specific SSC uh, entry to handle that. It also um, avoid to wait too long, for instance, in the IRQ of section of the kernel uh, to deliver the SSC events. The SSC event will be delivered right away um, because the interrupts are, that needs to be uh, injected, let's say, by the SBI will be taken in M mod and will interrupt uh, the kernel execution. So this can be seen as NMI. Um, and it does not use so much OS specific resources, except some memories and stacks, which uh, will be allocated for each event. So amongst um, the problem, let's say that's um, at least the question that we are uh, currently uh, studying is the uh, encoding of events. So events can be nested and they have some priorities associated to these events. By default, uh, it's the event ID which encodes the priority and these ID zero is the highest priority. Uh, so we discussed that with um, on the tech PRS uh, mailing list, and we try to find a scheme that uh, allows to um, encode the priority in the uh, event IDs. Um, the best solution we came up with is um, to have the global events that are less um, that have a priority. Um, less than um, the local events. And the platform events will also be less prioritized by local events. But yeah, maybe some implementers might want to have platform events that are higher priority uh, of the other ones. So if, if anybody has uh, any ideas, uh, not ideas to encode that, uh, you're welcome to participate. Um, so the SSC context is made of a lot of general purpose registers, and we'll see that later. There are some questions about that, uh, about uh, how much register should we save. Is this a good idea to do that like, like this? But at least for the moment, the spec is um, using that. Um, so which means that we will save 
the SBI will save a set of registers of general purpose registers when actually calling the SSE handler in S mode, which will allow you to uh, nest um, SSE events on top of interrupts or whatever it is currently uh, executing. So quick uh, pros cons for uh, SSE versus pseudo NMI. So currently uh, a pseudo NMI um, series was submitted, um, <clears throat> which does not address everything that we want to address with SSE. Um, one advantage of SSE is that it's a true NMI-like event. Uh, as I said, we can interrupt the kernel at any time, uh, even during uh, the exception path, really early in the exception path. Uh, it also allows to nest events on top of each other. Um, we have a faster delivery time than standard IRQs, but to be confirmed, we'll see that in a later slide. Um, minimal modification of existing code base. Uh, I mean, the SSE support is purely in addition to what exists currently. We don't modify anything of the IRQs, masking, uh, and so on. And it's easily extensible. It's pure software implementation which will allow to add new events and whatever we want to, to the SSE uh, system. Uh, one of the cons is that it requires uh, SSE compatible SBI. So this means that um, we, if you are using uh, a specific SBI, you will need to implement uh, the SSE support, which can be quite tricky if you have some uh, advanced preemption in the SBI implementation. Uh, and we'll see that later. Yeah, uh, there is also some additional work, let's say, to retrieve the current task struct in uh, the RISC-5 uh, current port. For the Sulu NMI, um, one of the pros is that it does not require at all um, an SBI support, and um, a few parts of the interrupt handling needs to be modified. It's simpler than SSE, at least uh, from what we saw, but um, the critical section in the kernel, so such as the exception handling, are still uninterruptible. Now we, we need to wait, at least it can be nested right away. Um, it does not support uh, nesting uh, nor priority, at least it uses what is provided by the hardware. And there have been some performance loss uh, measured for the existing use case. Uh, so this is from the series, uh, you can look at that um, on the mailing list. So one of the big, biggest problem I'd say um, that I tried to address is that, as I said, SSE can interrupt the kernel at any time, anywhere, and mainly during exception handling, which happens. Um, since we need the current task for uh, accounting for preempt, uh, preempt count and so on when entering the NMI, NMI path, um, we need to uh, retrieve this current task. And this is uh, a bit of a problem for us because uh, the current task is stored in uh, the CSR as scratch. And at the beginning of the exception handling, we switch this CSR as scratch register with TP. Um, and depending if you were entering from kernel space or user space, the current task might be in CSR as scratch or in TP which um, is not really convenient for us to, to reliably get the current task. So we need a way to know exactly where is the current task located and it's based on the address and on the uh, previously executed um, context. Uh, I tried multiple things using address comparison, uh, checking with labels inside the exception link path, which is quite unreliable and not really flexible. Um, I also tried so using labels instead of address, and finally it's also a bit fixed. And finally, the last thing that I decided to go with is to annotate um, the sources with fix up like data. So it kind of seemed like a, a huge thing to to address this problem, but I haven't been able to come with a better idea yet. So um, the idea is to actually push some um, annotation into a, a specific section. Um, and as you can see uh, on the right side, um, there is only a few parts of the kernel that needs to be annotated with that. And then in the SSE handler part, uh, we actually iterate through um, this task location, so current task location, 
to actually match um, match the correct register in which the task thread is located. Um, so we annotate the task with um, so the the first part is where is located the task thread when we are entering from S mod, and the second one is um, where is located the task thread for where we are entering from user mod. So depending on the lines, as I said, uh, it might be located in either uh, one or the other, and this is not cool. So uh, clearly, if we had a, um, an over scratch register, but this is a bit too late for that, uh, it would have been much easier. Um, some of the problems that were um, raised um, on the mailing list is that this SBI extension creates a, a bond between the SBI specification and the risk of five unprivileged ESA, I say, uh, because we have a, a struct that contains uh, all the general purpose registers. So ARM uh, went with some different way that they do not provide any binary structure to the SDI handler. They actually request the OS to call the SBI at least not the SBI, but uh, the trusted firmware implementation to retrieve each registers. So this has an additional cost and we'd like to avoid that. So that's why um, at least this specification address that and it's quite efficient. Um, but it restricts the set of registers that are saved when entering SSE handlers. So there have been some discussion, potentially we could save less general purpose registers but I'm not sure it solves uh, the problems of the, of the cherry spec, which needs some additional CSR and things like this to, to be saved. So to, the cherry spec is quite big. It's like 400 pages. So I wasn't able to read everything, but at least Jessica Clark raised some problems on the mailing list with that. Um, some numbers with this implementation. So we have made a, a proof of concept and a RFC was sent at least for the kernel part on the kernel mailing list. Um, we made a proof of concept with the PME overflow uh, IRQs. Um, we went from, so this is purely in terms of instruction executed and with normal IRQ handling, we are at like uh, 1,600 instructions executed. And with SSE event handling, we are at like 800 instructions. So this includes the M mod uh, execution, of course. Um, we don't have yet, um, and this is the next steps to be done, to gather more precise number using uh, hardware platforms to, to measure the impact of uh, catches and so on. Um, one um, additional um, um, point of the SSE event is that we don't have any jitter due to interrupts being disabled. So which means that uh, if you are executing in a, in a section of the kernel where interrupts are, di are disabled, you will have to wait for the interrupts to be re-enabled, for the interrupts to be, uh, the PMU interrupts to be handled. So this can add, um, depending on your configuration, quite uh, a few um, uh, instructions. Um, so the current status is that the implementation uh, in the kernel is like 1,000 line of code and similarly for OpenSBI. And the SBI extension is still in review um, and could be ratified in Q3 uh, 2024 uh, for SBI v3. So um, do you have any ideas, and remarks, feedback? You mentioned that SSE sort of solves your jitter problem. Yeah. With does, does the pseudo NMI solution also solve your jitter problem because you aren't masking, you're only masking external interrupts, not the interrupt that would be injected here or? Uh, so with SSE, we actually don't modify interrupt status at all, but the interrupts are going to be handled in M mod, so they are going to be handled right away. I mean, it's not uh, depending on the S mod state. Uh, of the interrupts, so we don't have any jitter, as I said. So, and and then the, the yes, the implementation itself is pure software, but the configuration, of course, of the interrupt delegation and so on, is done in the SBI uh, and relies on the hardware. Yeah. But if you're doing pseudo NMI, you wouldn't be disabling interrupts either, right? Or, or... 
<coughs> yeah, pseudonym may also solve the same problem by selectively okay. disabling the mask, interrupt mask. The problem with this that affects uh, the, all the workload, like anything you are running that basically adds the extra overhead while for switching those things. So that's why the slide says that 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 two percent additional overhead for everything. But here it's selective, like it's first uh, SS is faster and mm -hmm. also uh, you enable it only for uh, why it gets kicked in when you are using for in, uh, compared to the pseudo NMI. Okay, yeah, I guess I'm not super familiar with the pseudo NMI, but I would imagine like instead of well, you, you, there's the, you can globally disinter disable interrupts for S mode using the interrupt enable bit, and then you can like disable external interrupts using a different bit. So if pseudo NMI is just disabling external interrupts instead of globally, yeah. no. Local interrupt because this is a local. This is not an external interrupt. The yeah. overflow interrupt is a. Yeah. It's a local uh, major interrupt, local interrupt number thirteen. So you have to manage the entire interrupt mask with that. Okay, so there's there's actually more registers that need to be modified with pseudo interrupt. Okay. That's why you see that two percent overhead. Because like I would imagine like the, the you know the easiest way to solve all of your ABI concerns with SSE is if you just inject an interrupt, use it you know from in mode, and then use the normal interrupt handling infrastructure. But, yeah, but then you, you lose uh, the benefit of uh, being able to handle the interrupt right away. If the interrupts are disabled by the kernel, you will need to wait for the interrupts to be re -enabled. Yeah, I, I wonder if there, was a, there would be a way to not disable interrupts in the kernel, but probably not because... Uh, not you, yeah, yeah, to save and restore, right? So. Uh, and for instance, in the exception uh, handling path, uh, interrupts are disabled when entering them, and you can't re enable interrupt right away uh, because you would mess up the whole stack and you would overwrite uh, the previous context. So that's why the pseudo NMI cannot interrupt the kernel at any time. I mean, in, in a few parts of the kernel, at the, in the exception handling part, it won't be able to, to handle that. So this is, uh, let's say, critical for uh, mainly RAS errors, which are um, hardware reported errors uh, that needs to be handled as fast as possible, because if you let um, the, the fault to propagate, Potentially, you can mess up the whole kernel um, rather than offlining the page as soon as possible. Uh, the um, I guess question, can you software simulate any of this stuff so that we can get it in CI? The, the reason I ask is this sort of code is, tends to be notoriously fragile and the events you're talking about are fairly rare because yep. they're RAS events. Yep. Um, so the mix of rare events and fragile code is means that exactly. it tends to break over time. So having something in simulation so that we can put it in yep. CI and make sure it doesn't break. So exactly, the spec actually allows to inject the event from the S mod, okay. but uh, you won't be able to inject um, the event exactly where you want them to, to be injected, right? Because this is a synchronous. Yep. Uh, so we have some in synchronous way to do so because if an, uh, if a specific heart uh, inject um, an event on another heart, then it will be it will be delivered at uh, a specific point of time, but you don't know which one. What I did to test some specific uh, point of interruption in, is with Spike. Uh, I was actually being able to modify the MIP registers to generate an interrupt to the M mod and then to request the M mod to inject the SSE event at that specific point of time. So what I did is in the exception handling path, I just put a breakpoint, um, modify M, uh, MIP and request the M mod to inject the SSE event at this specific uh, point. But um, you are right that uh, the, the main problem with that is that you'd like to test uh, approximately a, a lot of uh, point of injection which is not really possible uh, right now. Yeah. Are there any interrupts that can, as you're executing the instructions themselves, cause other sort of RAS events that, yeah. that have to be handled? Yeah. Because they're particularly nasty, yeah. <laughs> nasty cases. Yeah. And there is for sure a lot of bugs remaining. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So the, the ABI between supervisor and the M mode, is it tied to the SBI version or is there a... Uh, so yeah, the, so you are right. The, the kind of the ABI is uh, specified in the specification. So I guess this will evolve probably. Right. Um, and that's why I think maybe Jessica raised that point is that um, we, we need to find a way to make this, uh, let's say, uh, which work all the time, 
and do not have to modify this because we need to add a register and so on. So yeah, because I can totally see like for shadow stack and things like yeah, that, we'll have that's what, new yeah. contract. This needs to be considered. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, over specification that might uh, impact this one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, clearly uh, we need feedback from, uh, as you said, shadow stack, uh, cherry and so on. Yeah. yeah. These um, macros that I think you added to uh, add this data into this different section, um, yeah. is there a way to programmatically identify where those need to be added? <laughs> I'd like so, but um, at least from what I tested and what I looked at, it's it's really difficult to, to um, identify where it is located. Um, how could we do that? Um, I mean, you need to, to have the, the, the code location, exact point where it's switched, uh, which context in which it is. So this is actually uh, this that is, let's say, uh, doing that um, in, a, in a programmatic way. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Part, of the, yeah. Part of the problem here is that we're, we're really abusing TP because we don't yeah. have TLS in the kernel. Mm. So this is sort of violating the API. So we need to write an ABI, like a you know, mm -hmm. M C mode equals kernel type ABI, where we're allowed to do this kind of stuff with TP. And then this is kind of dwarf. So imagine that sort of thing happening. That would be a lot of work. And it'd probably just be as buggy as mm -hmm. what we have now. Right? Like <laughs> it's kind of chaos at a certain point. I, mean, I guess it depends on what you want to do with the, the information, but. To a first approximation, basically any instruction that touches CSR scratch, which you can just look at the encoding of the instruction, is an instruction where you would need some sort of annotation. Yeah, yeah like, like, so at least tell all the places you might need one. Right. Not tell what you need, but yeah, you need one. then the hard part mm -hmm. is what is now in scratch, right? And sometimes that's not even apparent from the code. You have to go figure out, yeah, all this other stuff, which who knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, fortunately, this is not. Uh, everyone in the kernel, we we have only a small part of the code, yeah, but this one is problematic. It's in the slow path of the SSN link, but still. Did you have any problem with finding your task struct when you're doing like a preemption of SSE events? So like an S you're already in an SSE handler, but you receive another SSE event? Um, good question. Actually, it's not... Um, I guess it, no, no, it it works, but um, let me think about it. Why uh, there is no problem with that? Yeah, is that oh? But I guess you would have to like follow your PC back to see. Oh, you're in yeah, SSE yeah, and exactly. Follow yeah, your yeah. PC back so, again. So so yeah, you are right. Actually, I found that because um, I tested with some um, let's say a large injection, uh, a lot of injection, and at some point. I always ended up with a TP uh, corrupted. So um, I had to do some execution trust with Spike. And it was actually quite useful to, to understand what was going on and see that my SSE event was actually interrupting the exception handling path at a specific path. I, I fixed a, a few lines and I was, OK, it works. And, and then I ran against the tests and it exploded. So I had to find uh, where exactly uh, the CSR scratch is modified. And fortunately, as I said, it's only in the session and the path. After that, we can reliably uh, say, okay, it's in TP, uh, but that's okay. So your, your, your implementation does support preemption of like nesting of SSE events? Yeah, yeah. Or at least it doesn't crash in ways that we know. Yeah. Right, so. sure, but that's part of the reason we ended up with this, right? Because if you're trying to do PC backtracing stuff, you kind of end up with the same, you know, no debug info PC backtracing stuff that if you're trying to backtrace PC, PCs through exception yeah. entry, you're just in for a bad time. Yeah. So that's annotations, <laughs> right? Yeah, and backtrace is also supported in SSE event. We, because in SSE, we switch the stack. So we also construct uh, some dummy uh, stack frame uh, before entering SSE event on those, and then we can have a correct backtrace. Cool, so I think like one minute or something? Oh, you want to talk? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, just more of a feedback required uh, rather than a question. So we're going to use this one. Once the spec is ratified, we're going to use this one for PORF and uh, to enable critical checks and profiling where interrupts is disabled. 
So it's a bit of a different what other architecture does for Perf. So where MO takes the interrupt first, then injects this event. Mm -hmm. So if when you have any concern, like it will break, like as of now it doesn't break from whatever testing we are doing. But if you think it will break some use case that we have not covered, so please mm -hmm. shout here or at the yeah. mailing list. It, it, it is kind of high -wide thing. Yeah. So yeah. Really hard. <laughs> so and, yeah. yeah. And also, like uh, whether we should enable it by default or we should have a choice in config saying, uh, if you want critical section profiling, then use SSC. Otherwise, don't use SSC because it's kind of a scary path. Like it's mm -hmm. fast, yes, of course, but it's a kind of scary path where your M mode gets a lot of control to get into the S mode. So and uh, direct injection bypassing all the interrupt and entire interrupt hierarchy, uh, IRC domains, everything in kernel. So. Kind of like <laughs> the switch. Yeah, it's also about perfs. Yeah, it's also about perfs. So.